Sita. It's, uh, I must thank Samad for uh, inviting me to deliver these four lectures. Um, and I'm particularly delighted that uh, Sitaram is uh, chairing this first session. Um, besides being the general secretary, he's an old friend and classmate, and I'm privileged to have him here. I'm also thankful to all of you all for taking time off on a Saturday evening and being here to join the discussion, uh, which uh, I would try and begin today. Uh, there's two things I'd like to say. One, of course, is that um, I would be, uh, since there's a lot of, by way of, uh, quotations, references from Marx itself, from Capital itself, I would be going back to this text as often as I can because uh, I think it's better to be, though there are many translations and I've used only one, um, I think it would be better that I try to be uh, correct in terms of what I'm quoting, whichever the translation is. Well, to start with, if we, if we, when we get together to mark the 150th anniversary of uh, the publication of the first German edition of uh, Das Kapital, and of course, we know that the other two volumes came much later, many years later. And uh, despite the fact that Engels did say that volume three was done by the time volume one was published, we know that um, a lot of it was in the form of quotations which Marx had from the literature which he was analyzing. And uh, there was a lot of it and uh, interspersed it particularly in volume three with comments. But we essentially have these three volumes. And when we meet to dis discuss um, these volumes of the work in Capital, uh, this is not obviously only because this is a seminal text uh, of great historical interest, which of course it is. But we meet to celebrate a treatise that is in some sense influenced um, all those who over the last 150 years have actually tried to understand the nature and dynamics of capitalism. This of course includes a large number of workers and peasants movements to which uh, uh, Capital, and of course, uh, a lot more writings of Marx and Engels, but Capital in particular was um, the equivalent, um, as um, Engels put it, uh, of the Bible to the devout Christian as it was to the working class in continental Europe. That's the way in which Engels described Capital. But it's also true that um, uh, this is a text which uh, provides us with the essentials of a method that helps us to a certain extent to extend and contemporize the, and the analysis in capital. Uh, in some, it's a living text uh, with the abiding influence. I must just correct that I, my third lecture is not revising capital, but revisiting capital in the age of finance. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> I wouldn't be trying to revise this. So for these reasons, uh, in the 150 years since the publication of capital, we know there's been a number of attempts on, on a number of people have attempted to, uh, to read this and interpret it in very different ways, with each reading being influenced by the social, political, and economic conditions of the, kind, of the time. That, of course, must be the way, it, or that, that's the way it should be, given the fact that this is not just uh, uh, an, an economic treatise, but also a political testament, as uh, Sitaram mentioned. But it's also uh, important because uh, of the fact that Marx himself, in some sense, um, believed that, uh, uh, well, uh, theorization in general, but political economy in particular, uh, is influenced by substantially by the social and political conditions of the time in which new ideas emerge, including those, of course, of the classical economists. Uh, and that, uh, that in some sense, the, uh, the nature of uh, the, the society and the contradictions which characterize it at the relevant point of time influence the nature of thought which emerges out of that context. So when we return to capital today, it's not merely to understand its method and substance, which of course is important, but to use Marx's method to assess the transformation of capitalism over these 150 years, and to try and see that while recognizing this trans transformation, how it influences our own reading and analysis of the, of, the, of the substance of capital and how we apply it to the understanding of contemporary capitalism or current-day capitalism. In fact, if we look at many of the writings uh, of Marx and Engels uh, in these sort of uh, decades between the Communist Manifesto and the first volume of Capital, it would appear um, that uh, uh, they would have considered it odd that there would at all be an occasion 150 years after the publication of the first volume where we would be considering capital as being anything more than a text of historical interest. Uh, 
because their idea, they clearly believed that the rapid development of the productive forces evidenced by capitalism in England, um, the, the, the process by which this rapid development of the productive forces came into conflict with the social relations of production, the crisis that the anarchy of capitalism uh, results in, which, we'll be, which I'll be looking at in the next lecture, and of course, the fact that the emergence and growth of capitalism produces its own grave diggers in the form of the working class, that all of this would result very soon, at that point of time, that seems to have been the expectation, in the transcendence of capitalism itself. In fact, if 1840, the revolutions of 1847, 1848 were missed opportunities, that did not mean that they didn't expect that, if not in the last quarter of the 19th century, at least in the first half of the 20th century or later, we would see the transcendence of capital and therefore it was unlikely, I think, that they would be expecting that we would 150 years after the first volume be sitting here examining this text and, and, and its relevance for capitalism as it uh, exists today. The per perception implicit in this idea that we're going to see this transcendence uh, in what was to a certain extent perceived as a revolutionary time Part of the reason Engels was sort of pressurizing Marx, we know, to complete uh, capital was that he felt that this text was needed given what was happening in terms of the, uh, the movements of the working people and the working class in particular, which he thought was occurring already in England and Europe. And so therefore, when we, uh, when we look, at, look at this perception, the implicit idea is that the progressive character of capitalism would be its own undoing with technological changes turning the social relations that unleash them into, into, into their own fetters. So a consequence of that perception was that alongside the discussion of the ways in which the antagonistic relationship between capital and labor shaped the form and intensity of exploitation and determined the distribution of income under capitalism, that uh, associated with that was Marx's emphasis on the transformative nature of capitalist development. Once the pro process of primitive accumulation had created the conditions for the extraction of surplus value in a system with equivalent exchange, that is where commodities were being exchanged at their full value, <laughs> accumulation in the quintessentially capitalist form begins and crudely coercive primitive accumulation moves into the shadows. This is in, 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 in my view, in Marx's view. And once the force of capitalist accumulation unleashes the, pro unleashes the productive forces, Productivity increases, cheapens the, mean, cheapen the means of subsistence, uh, leading to surplus being extracted in the form of relative surplus value rather than absolute surplus value. That is rather than largely through an extension of the working day or through an increase in the intensity of labor, but rather it comes because of changes in the, in the, in the, in the means of production, which results in the cheapening in particular of the elements of subsistence or the means of subsistence, subsistence which enter into the workers' consumption basket. This is at times interpreted as an almost linear shift from primitive to normal modes of capital accumulation and from absolute to relative surplus value extraction. That linearity is also read by many into this idea that there is, to a certain extent, an inevitability that at a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society would come into conflict with the existing relations of production which begins an era of social revolution. Now this was indeed the process which in Marx's view gave rise to capitalism, rendered it transient and prepared the ground for the abolition of private property. Marx built, we know, into his analysis three tendencies that made capitalism like previous modes of production almost inevitably transient. The first, as already discussed, is the logic of, of accumulation under capitalism that results in the rapid development of the productive forces and brings it into conflict with the social relations of production. In fact, Marx went even further and saw new forms under capitalism as pointing to a socialization of production necessitated by the concentration and centralization of capital and preparing the grounds for socialism within the womb of capitalism itself. One such form, the role and impact of which has since proved substantially different, which I would refer to in the third of these lectures, is the joint stock company which Marx described as reflective of the complete separation of capital ownership and the actual production process. The, the sort of shift to ownership by social capital, and in his words, the abolition of the capitalist mode of production within the capitalist mode of production itself. The second of these tendencies, which was to lead to the inevitable transcendence of capitalism, was the conflict between capital and labor that cannot be resolved under capitalism, 
and provides the ground for the overthrow of the system based on private property and wage labor by the working class itself. And the third, of course, is the inevitably, inevitability of crisis under capitalist accumulation, which I discuss in the next lecture, that provides the trigger for intensification of class conflict and unleashes revolutionary movements. Marx, Marx framed his discussion in Capital, we know, as a critique of political economy, especially the works of the classical economists, from the physiocrats through Adam Smith and Ricardo, and in constant opposition to the vulgar economists of that period, who saw, who, whom he saw as conscious or unconscious apologists for the bourgeoisie. Marx himself dates the beginning of his study of political economy, diverting, as was mentioned, from his study of jurisprudence, that he pursued as a subject subordinated to philosophy and history to 1842-43. In that year, as editor of the Rheinische Zeitung, he found himself in the embarrassing position of having to discuss what are known, what he describes as material interests, referring here to discussions in the Rhenish parliament on forest theft and division of landed property, the condition of the, the peasantry in the Moselle Valley, and the debates on free trade and protective tariffs. Marx then, did find some answers to some of his questions in the work of the classical economists. While appreciative of that work, he found it inadequate to the purpose and intense, an intense study that, uh, to his purpose, an intense study led him to an explanation why. Classical political economy, in his view, while associated with and the ideological accompaniment of a rising capitalism, belonged to the period in which class struggle in capitalism was yet underdeveloped. This gave it its scientific perspective, which allowed the classical economists to individually contribute many important insights regarding the nature and dynamics of capitalism. These included the identification of productive labor with activity that yielded a surplus product uh, and contributed to accumulation, tracing the source of surplus to production rather than circulation, identifying labor time as the ultimate source of value, Ricardo, and recognizing that missionary while enhancing productivity and profits can displace labor, which of course went on to the formulation of the idea of the reserve army of labor. This of course inevitably led among the classical economists and Ricardo in particular to the recognition of the antagonism embedded in the, system, in the capitalist system. However, the reason this analysis proved inadequate to Marx was that, uh, uh, that uh, re political economy remaining within the bourgeois horizon in so far you know remaining the bourgeois horizon in so far as it looked at uh, that capitalism not as a historical phase in the evolution of social production but as something which which was was sort of uh, uh, near eternal uh, that it was such that according to, to Marx even its last great representative David Ricardo in the end consistently made the antagonism of class interests, so wages and profits, so profits and rent, the starting point of the investigation, but then naively take, took the antagonism for a social law of nature. Hence, insofar as political economy remains within this bourgeois horizon, it can only remain a science while the class struggle is latent or manifests itself only in isolated or sporadic phenomena. And even then, it was in essence a science of enrichment which saw such processes of enrichment as a natural order. Before this turn to political economy, Marx had already made the transition inspired by his early engagement with the young Hegelians to a radical Republican position with a social dimension. He contrasted the Christian state, which was an association of believers and a system that legitimized and protected feudal privileges with the rational state, which convinced which converted the aims of the individual into general aims, crude instinct into moral inclination, natural independence into spiritual freedom, by the individual finding his good in the life of the whole, and the whole in the frame of mind of the individual. So therefore he was soon convinced that legal relations and political forms originate in the material conditions of life, the totality of which Hegel, as, as Sitara mentions, embraces within the term civil society, and that the anatomy of this civil society had to be found in political economy. Seen in this light, Marx's extended engagement with political eco economy, which began at this time, was part of an effort to combine the application of the Hegelian dialectic, now of course turned on, on its head, 
and the revolutionary ideas derived from the French Revolution and the early socialists with an understanding and critique of English political economy. English political economy, because it was a progressive science, representing as it did the still progressive capitalism in conflict with the dying feudal order. Critique, because with Ricardo having recognized the conflict between the different class interests, the science of bourgeois economy in Marx's words had reached the limits beyond which it cannot pass. Nevertheless, nevertheless, Marx clearly believed that its insights, that is the insights of classical political economy, combined with a critique of its inadequate and faulty analysis and its limited vision, could take the science in a direction where it became a weapon for the working class. The working class needed this weapon because that class was the instrument, in Marx's view, through which history would ensure transcendence of capitalism, a process that bourgeois political economy, which saw capitalism as the end, end of history, could not contemplate. This perception was in keeping with Marx's adherence to and use of Hegel's dialectic, which in its rational form, he argued, includes in its, comprehens in its comprehensive and affirmative recognition of the existing state of things, at the same time also the recognition of the negation of that state, of its inevitable breaking up because it regards every historically developed social form as in fluid move movement and therefore takes into account its transitional nature, not less than its momentary existence because it lets nothing impose upon it and in some sense is critical, is, is critical and revolutionary. So it was the combination of political economy with this, with this larger perspective, which I really am not competent to go into in great detail, which led up to uh, what we see in these three volumes. While classical political economy was his point of departure, Marx's discussion in Capital made a substantial, marked a substantial leap forward in a number of ways. There was the obvious factor of method, where he starts with the elementary form in which wealth appears under capitalism, commodities, to first identify the, the substance of value, which is abstract labor time. That in turn gives the magnitude, magnitudes that define the proportions in which commodities exchange in the market uh, or their exchange values. While commodities may be produced and exchanged in different contexts, starting at the borders, separating tribal communities, and moving on to the thriving urban centers of feudal regimes, commodity under ca production under capitalism, he saw as different for two reasons, as we, as we know. First, only such products are best suited to serve as commodities, as, as a result from different kinds of labor, each being carried out independently and for the own account of private individuals. So the developed division of labor associated with capitalism universalizes commodity production. And second, labor power itself appears as a commodity where the labor, laborer alienates the use value of his capacity to labor and earns the exchange value of that capacity to labor. The recognition of the distinction between the laborer and his or labor power and between the value of labor power, which is socially and historically determined, and the value that the laborer con contributes in the form of living labor during the working day was the most significant contribution that Marx made to the advance of, pol of political economy. The idea that surplus value emanates from the fact that worker, the worker is paid a wage which is equal to the value of reproducing labor power, which of course is short of the amount he contributes when the capitalist chooses to use his capacity to labor as a use value in production along with the means of, mean, means of production. The capitalist who has brought the, bought the right to use the value of labor power, which he has paid for at its value, acquires the right to the surplus value that is congealed in the new commodity produced when he combines labor power with the material forms of capital he owns in the process of production. The surplus value acquired allows for the continuous self-expansion or as some others describe it, valorization of capital, even when all exchanges occur at the full values of the commodities involved. This was the fundamental conceptual advance made in Marx's enunciation of the, the, of the labor theory of value. One consequence of these defining features of capitalism is that the circuit of capital relevant, uh, the, the circuit of capital relevant to the capitalist is the circuit of money and productive commodity capital. Money, M, as the ultimate expression of exchange value, is, deploy, is deployed to acquire commodities that embody surplus value. I mean, it took, um, commodities in the form of means of production and labor power to produce commodities that embody surplus value 
which are then converted in the sphere of circulation to a larger sum of money, M prime. The circuit MC M prime is no more the result of accidental price variations or unequal exchange realized through the manipulations of merchant capitalists, but the generation of surplus value that allows for the constant self-expansion of value that is the form of existence of capital. This makes the production of use value incidental to, though necessary for the capitalist, who as capital personified is focused on the extraction of surplus value for accumulation. In so far as the capitalist is capital personified, his motivating force is not the acquisition and enjoyment of use values, but the acquisition and augmentation of exchange values. He is fanatically intent on the valorization of value. Consequently, he ruthlessly forces the human race to produce for production's sake. In the process, however, and I return to this, he plays a progressive role and spurs on the development of society's productive forces and the creation of those material conditions of production, which alone can form the real basis of a higher form of society, a society in which the full and free development of every individual forms the ruling principle. It should be clear, therefore, that what makes a commodity producing system quintessentially capitalist is not the universalization of exchange, but the generalization of commodity production in the sense that labor power too is a commodity. Unlike under slavery or feudalism, where the slave owner, owner or feudal lord controls the laborer and has access to his or her labor time because of bondage and coercive power, the capitalist confronts the worker as the owner of labor power with the freedom to work for whomsoever she or he chooses. Since labor power is the capacity to labor, the laborer must also be in a position and willing to alienate this capacity and offer it for sale to the capitalist. For these choices to be made, she or he must be free in a double sense. Free to dispose of her or his labor, labor power as a commodity, and free of or separated from all commodities that would allow her or him to use and realize the value of this capacity to labor. Marx did at times present the realization of this dual freedom as the first step, and I'd like to repeat that, the first step in the development of capitalism through a process of so-called primitive accumulation in which peasants and petty producers are separated through expropriation from possession, control, or ownership of the means of production. Such expropriation was defended by bourgeois political economy as being the result of wealth uh, accumulated by an elite that was diligent, intelligent, and above all, frugal. However, it was in actual history, as Marx documented, the result of conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, in short, force, which produces producers from safe, which, which, which uh, uh, divorce producers from the means of production. While emancipating these producers from serfdom and the fetters of the guilds, it also left them with nothing to sell but their labor power. There were also other forms in which non-market processes were used to accumulate capital as part of the process of primitive accumulation. To quote Marx, the rising bourgeoisie needs the power of the state and uses it to regulate wages, that is to force them into the limits suitable for making pro profit, to lengthen the working day, and to keep the worker himself at his normal level of dependence. This is an essential part of so-called primitive accumulation. In fact, at the end of the 17th century in England, it took the form, Marx argues, of a combination of moments that embraces the colonies, the national debt, the modern tax system, and the system of protection. That is, his understanding of primitive accumulation extended substantially in, in, in directions which brought in not merely the fact that there was the separation of the, of, the, of the worker from the means of production, the expropriation of assets, the concentration of capital in a few hands, but also the use of the state in multiple, multiple ways, including colonialism, in order to be able to engage in the task of primitive accumulation. Once this first step was complete, capital, capital accumulated at one pole confronts the doubly free worker and capital accumulation based on surplus value extraction in production proceeds. I would come back to why I have underlined this idea of the interpretation that this was in Marx, a first step. <clears throat> 
Accompanying and following this process is another transition that Marx presented as reflective of the development of capitalism proper. Since the magnitude of surplus value depends on the total length of the working day and the value of labor power, it can be increased, as we all know, either by length the, the lengthening the working day, and the, and which is the extraction of absolute surplus value, or by reducing the value of labor power through productivity in sex increases in sectors that produce the uh, goods entering into the work worker subsistence bucket, basket, as I mentioned, which is the extraction of relative surplus value. In either case, since the ratio of surplus value to, to variable capital rises, that is the S by V ratio rises, so does the rate of exploitation and, 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 and the ratio of surplus labor to necessary labor. But in Marx's view, it is the extraction of relative surplus value through productivity enhancing investments that was characteristic of capitalism in its fully developed form. Since capital must confront doubly free labor in the market for capital accumulation in its full-fledged form to occur, the fact that labor power in that form must emerge through a process of primitive accumulation affects the ability of the system to extract relative surplus value in the first instance. When money capital first seeks to realize the circuit MCM dice, MM prime, it does not have ready at hand enough doubly free workers. It extracts surplus by bringing the existing world's, world of peasants and pretty producers operating with pre-existing techniques of production under its sway or through what Marx identifies as the uh, formal subsumption of labor to capital. In those conditions, only absolute surplus value can be extracted since the technical conditions of production are given. It is only when workers who have nothing to sell but their labor power confront capital accumulated in the hands of a few that the conditions where the owners of capital can transform the process of production and enhance surplus value extraction in the form of relative surplus value are created. This is the phase of the real subsumption of labor by capital. Hence, at many points in his analysis, Marx appears to suggest that the extraction of relative surplus value based on the real subsumption of labor by capital inevitably displaces the extraction of absolute surplus value through the formal subsumption of labor by capital. In Marx's view, the production of surplus value, and I'm quoting him, requires a specifically capitalist mode of production, a mode of production which, along with its methods, means, and conditions, arises and develops spontaneously on the basis of the formal subsumption of labor under capital. This formal subsumption, he argues, is then replaced, and that's his word, by a real subsumption. These, these suggestions that primitive accumulation is only a first step in capitalist evolution, and that absolute surplus value extraction will be displaced by relative surplus value extraction, could be interpreted as resulting from Marx's reading of the dynamism that post-industrial revolution capitalism displayed. It could also be seen as reflective of the view that a combination of workers' movements and legislation in the form of the factory acts, which he discussed in detail in Capital, they led to in England, the factory acts they led to in England, would force capital to limit the working day and to accelerate technical change so that accumulation depends largely on relative surplus value. These features were the, even then were, of course, typical only of the empirical ground for Marx's analysis of capitalism. As Marx noted in his preface to the first German edition, his intention was to examine the capitalist mode of production and the conditions of production and exchange corresponding to that mode by analyzing the capitalism of England of that time, which was its classic ground. The fact that other countries, including Germany, were not characterized by the dynamism that England displayed did not undermine the generality of that analysis because, in Marx's view, the country that is more, more developed industrially only shows to the less developed the image of their own future. In Marx's understanding, though by the time Capital Volume 1 was completed, more than a century had passed since the emergence of industrial capitalism in England and elsewhere, the capitalist mode was not present in its pure form even in Germany where the first edition was launched. In practice, in most contexts, including Germany, alongside of modern evils of capitalism, a whole series of inherited evils oppressed the people. This primacy of the English case 
with an emphasis on its more progressive features, mattered in two ways for Marx's assessment of capitalism during the years when he worked on capital. First, the technological achievements of the Industrial Revolution in England made him conclude that while in time capitalist relations would prove a fetter on the development of the productive forces, capitalism was a system which he saw even in his most cynical writings as having contributed, in his words, to a wondrous development of the social productive forces. Second, Marx saw in this progressive character of capitalism to, to, en to an ability to ensure in time, and perhaps inexorably, the displacement and demise of primitive methods of production and backward rela relations of production. This kind of reading of the nature of actually existing capitalism was also encouraged by the fact that in Capital as it came to be published, Marx neither undertook an extensive analysis of the role of the state in supporting capitalist accumulation, of course, there are discussions, but not an extensive analysis, and providing a site for the persisting primitive accumulation of capital, which he had noted that the state was an important instrument and agency for the primitive accumulation of capital, but the analysis was not yet detailed enough because of, of the fact that the work remained in incomplete. Nor did he, in fact, in, 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 in earlier sort of uh, uh, chapterization of what capital was going to be, the state was an important uh, segment which was going to be, or, or, or agency which was going to be analyzed. Nor did he analyze the impact that capital expansion had on the peripheral countries and the colonies where its modernizing influence did not include, ex exclude coercive extraction of surplus, subordination of petty producers operating with primitive techniques, and reproduction of backward relations of production so as to maximize the extraction of absolute surplus value. The resulting optimism about the transformative potential of capitalism and the increasing assertion of the collective will of the working class possibly explains the fact that Marx, one, considered primitive accumulation as being confined to the early stages of capitalism before the capital wage labor relation is to a substantial extent universalized, Two, saw a sequential movement away from the formal to the real subsumption of, of labor by capital and from the, abstraction, um, from the extraction of absolute surplus value to the extraction of relative surplus value. And three, argued that this transition would be hastened by the ability of the working class to both limit the length of the working day and raise the level of wages. Any reading of world history over the last 150 years would indicate that the first two of these features which is the fact that primitive accumulation uh, occurs and that there's, uh, that there's both a combination of, 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 uh, of uh, extraction of absolute and relative surplus value with a combination of both the formal subsumption of labor by capital and the real subsumption of labor by capital, that the first two of these features have not been confined to specific phases of capitalism, but have persisted to differing degrees in different contexts across capitalist history. Even to the extent that Marx in dif uh, Marx's analysis was true of the class classic ground of, cap of, of, of capitalism he analyzed, namely England, it was by no means overwhelmingly the rule. And even though the expectation that capitalism would not survive through the 19th or first part of the 20th century, not that they named those dates, has been belied, capitalism's persistence has not been accompanied by a trans transformation in which the end of primitive accumulation the shift away from absolute surplus value extraction to relative surplus value extraction, and the strengthening of the, of the power of collective labor to win concessions from capital have been unambiguously visible at all points in time. Indeed, Marx too did recognize that capital focused on maximizing the enhancement of surplus value and accelerating capital accumulation would continue to seek ways of extracting absolute surplus value and the workers' effort to limit that may be only partially successful. As is detailed discussion on the failure of the Factories Act, the constant struggle to limit the working day, the tendency to increase the intensity of work within a, within a given working day, and the resort to payment of time and peace wages to chapters make clear capital is constantly aiming to maximize surplus value through what could be identified as primitive means within this discourse. So while a merely formal subsumption of labor under capital suffices for the production of absolute surplus value, Marx himself said, 
the unrestricted prolongation of the working day turned out to be a very characteristic product of large-scale industry, even long after relative surplus value extraction had begun. In sum, it is completely possible that the generation of absolute and relative surplus value can go hand in hand throughout the capitalist epoch and independent of the level of capitalist development. This also in occurs by ensuring the worker is not paid the full value of labor power, as was assumed in order to be able to bring out the true and, 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 and source of surplus value, even in a context in which we have an exchange of equivalence. So this also occurs by ensuring that the worker is not paid the full value of his labor power, as happens the, under the assumption that all commodities, including labor power, are, are exchanged as equivalents. Since wages are paid in money, and take various forms such as time and peace wages, it is possible to reduce the wage per unit of time, say an hour, to such a level where the commodities that the wage can buy are not enough to replenish the capacity to labor, and workers are forced to work long hours or more intensively in order even to earn a miserable wage. If, sur if surplus value is enhanced by paying workers less than the full value of labor power, it is being expanded through the expropriation of a part of what is the workers due in any given social and historical context and a due in the sense of paying the equivalent of the exchange value of that labor power. The point is that this remains true even 150 years after the publication of Capital. The growing presence of casual, uh, temporary and self-employed workers and the unleashing of competition between the reserve army of cheap labor constantly reproduced in the colonies earlier, in the peripheral countries of today, and workers in the metropolitan countries, the competition between these peripheral workers and, and the workers in metropolitan countries only aggravates this tendency. They create conditions where workers are forced to self-exploit themselves, create op opportunities for the extraction of absolute surplus value, even when technological advance helps enhance relative surplus value. Moreover, in as much as these conditions and the proliferation of finance result in indebtedness that leads to the loss of ownership or control over as assets on the part of workers, the middle classes and the peasantry, the expropriation of assets that can be sold or used later in surplus value generating productive activity becomes the means to extract surplus without the mediation of productive activity in the first instance. Finally, any study of actually existing capitalism must treat it as a world system and not just as an English phenomenon. Marx's discussion of imperialism outside of capital in his New York Tribune articles, for example, did recognize the role of surplus transfer and market access in the colonies in sustaining capital accumulation in capitalism's classic ground. And two, the role of the subordination of the petty, peasant, the petty producer and peasantry and capture of the state by capital in extracting the surplus that was transferred to England. Such transfers and market invasion continue to play a role through the 20th century and does so even today, now under the ages of finance as well. So the transformation that Marx took for granted, though visible and significant, has not been taken to completion, even in the developed capitalist world, and definitely not in the large, underdeveloped, or less developed periphery of capitalism. It is clear that the period after the Second World War, when unemployment in the developed world was low and welfare state measures were in place, was an exception rather than the rule. A feature of contemporary capitalism is the large size of the so-called informal sector and high proportion of informal employment. This is obvious in the less developed countries, where the informal economy, we know, accounts for between half and three quarters of all non-agricultural employment, with poor employment conditions involving lack of protection when wages are not paid, compulsory overtime, layoffs without notice or compensation, and the absence of benefits such as pensions and insurance. But with unemployment in the developed countries soaring and remaining high after the 2008 crisis, Descriptions of the labor market point to precarious conditions there as well. This has affected the young in particular, who are experiencing long spells of joblessness, suffer from large exposure to temporary and precarious jobs, and are forced to accept reductions in working time, but with even lower wages than before. So the dominant conclusion from the 150 years that have passed is the persistence in changed forms 
of the extremely intensive exploitation of workers and producers, especially in the periphery, through primitive forms of subsumption and the persistent reliance on absolute surplus value extraction and the realization of all of these at the expense of weakened labor with help from the state. The intensity of those, these means of exploitation increases when the correlation of power favors capital and society does not restrain it even partially. Moreover, ever since the onset of the monopoly phase of capitalism in the quarter of a century after Volume 1 was published, the role of the state as a means and site for primitive accumulation has hugely increased. Among the re reasons for the resilience of capitalism and this ability to find new avenues to extract surpluses using old means, um, I'm sorry, I mean, I mean, among the reasons for the resilience of capitalism are this ability to find new avenues to extract surpluses using old means. Even in contexts where the tendency for the rate of profit to fall is operative, and those contexts we know are limited for a number of reasons which I should discuss, it can be counteracted by raising the rate of surplus value by means such as this as we shall discuss in a later lecture. However, the fact that capitalism has proved to be more resilient than Marx and Engels expected is a call not for dropping the analysis on which it was based, but for taking forward what I think is the open-ended discussion in the still incomplete capital and for creati creatively applying the method that Marx and Engels developed. Such creative ap application must take into account the changes in capitalism at the end of, the prolong of, that, of that prolonged history and the implications this has for the nature of capitalism and its dynamics. By the 1840s, which is when Marx's engagement with political economy began, England having experienced the rise to dominance of capitalism was in the midst of the transformation wrought by the Industrial Revolution and had al already emerged as the world's leading imperial power. At the beginning of the 19th century, the majority of the workforce was engaged in agriculture and related sectors, and the non-agricultural sector had the characteristics of a handicraft economy. By the late 19th century, however, factory production was common, and according to the 1851 census itself, 47% of the workforce was employed in the secondary sector, which is manufacturing or industry and construction. This was the classic ground which provided the empirical basis on which Marx built his critique of the, of the, of the classical economists. Compared with that, circumstances are vastly different in the age of finance. In today's United Kingdom, industry and construction account for a fifth of total value added and agriculture and, and related activities for less than 1%. The fig figures are similar for the US and Germany. Services clearly dominate economic activity by a wide margin. Within services, finance, insurance, and real estate account for a fifth of total value added in the US, in the UK and the US. And finally, in the US, the share of domestic corporate profits accru accruing to financial companies increased from about 7% in 1947 to 29% in 2000, which is where it's, it stands today. The proliferation of finance has meant that financial assets have become an important mode of acquiring wealth and that ownership of financial assets is an important means of capital is, is accumulation. Associated with these features of the age of finance is the evidence that over long periods, not only are the wages of workers slow to rise or even stagnant, contributing to rising inequality when productivity rises, but that underlying this tendency is the fact that increasingly regular work is the exception, with a growing role for self-employment and casual short-term employment. To the extent that across a stagnant average wage, wage rates per hour of work vary, workers are required, if the market permits, to extend their number of hours of work to achieve some historically given target wage that allows for the reproduction of labor power. And an important factor underlying this tendency is the internationalization of capitalist production, as I noted, through which the large reserve army of cheap labor in less developed countries is used as a weapon to tame the demands of workers in the developed countries for decent working conditions and a decent wage. In a fragmented and segmented labor market, the role of capital in this form of extraction of absolute surplus value may be missed. But these features of contemporary capitalism must influence the analysis of capitalism deriving directly from Marxist capital, written while examining England's more dynamic industrial capitalism. This is what is going to be the dominant concern in the lectures that follow, 
in the first of which I would be looking at what was still an incomplete description of the determinants of crisis under capitalism and the implications of that in the context of current conditions of capitalism. In the third, I would like to turn to revisit capital in the age of finance, in which we need to look at one factor, and I just flag it today, which is that if we look at Marx's analysis of fictitious capital, which arises as a result of the coming of credit money, he basically recognized the fact that you can have a situation where there's an incre increasing divergence between real wealth in the system and the possibilities of extracting surplus value through the mediation of production and the accumulation of financial wealth, including an accumulation which occurs because of the trading of credit money itself. But this divergence, he argued in large measure, would in some sense disappear because of the fact that it leads up to crisis which devalues financial assets in substantial measure. The problem we face today is that it is true, firstly, that the divergence between the value of financial assets and the value of real wealth has increased hugely beyond what Marx might have contemplated at that point of time because of the nature of current contemporary finance. And when crises occur, while there is some loss of, of value of this, illusion, this illusory financial asset, it never goes back to the level at which it was. And the possession of financial assets, so long as the value of money is stable, is adequate enough to command not merely real assets, but also labor power. So how do we understand in the current context the way in which the process of extraction of surplus value would occur, in which accumulation of finance outside the realm which is mediated through production uh, influences the dynamics of capitalism. And finally, I will make an attempt to try and use these to understand the current crisis and the inability of capitalism as yet, close to a decade, to be able to transcend that crisis and get back to the normals, to the normal which it had prior to the 2007 period. Thank you.